All right. We're 10 past. And up next, we have lessons learned with creating platforms on Kubernetes with Mauricio and Salman. So without any further ado, take it away. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Uh, we will probably need our presentation on the screen. That's yeah. one thing. There you go. Perfect. So yeah, I think that that's kind of like the title. We will be talking about like challenges of building platforms on top of Kubernetes. And we will not make it easy for you folks. We will just uh, be very interactive. You go. Yes. So morning, everybody. Uh, how are we all doing? <laughs> yeah. Full room. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's so do this is, we're going to talk about building platforms on Kubernetes. There's some experience that we've had working with different organizations, different teams. Different oh, projects. Different projects as yeah. well. But we are going to focus on slightly on machine learning. So if you need to build a platform on machine learning, what kind of things you do. But I know uh, because we're going to talk about machine learning, this is now a rule. If you talk about machine learning, you have to mention chat GPT. If you don't, apparently the, uh, apparently the presentation doesn't count. So we'll play a game real quick before we get into the real thing. I'm going to present you with two quotes. One is a real quote, and one is a fake quote generated by ChatGPT. And you have to guess which one's true. Are we up for it? Yeah. yeah. All right, the first one, Donald Trump. Uh, people know Donald Trump? <laughs> All right, let's, let's go with this. So there's two quotes in here. The first one is, sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest, and you all know it. Right? So imagine in his own voice. So that's the first one. The second one is, my IQ is so high, it's tremendous. It's like Mount Everest, but with more, more gold. Which one's real? He has a point. Which he one? has a point. That's a very good point, but. <laughs> Which one? I'm well, say two, is two, two. Okay, people think two. Actually, Chad GPT is better at being Trump than Trump being Trump. Yeah. So yes, one is true. The second one is made up. Uh, so that's you know quite good. Let's do one more. Boris Johnson. People remember this guy? We're from UK, so we, we both come from UK. So here you go. One more. Let's see which one's. Great hair. Yeah. yeah, look at that. Good point. Right, so here you go. This is about Brexit, of course. My friend's Brexit was like a box of chocolates. Nobody knew what we were really getting, but it's scrumptious. That's what he says. And the, the second one is my policy on cake is pro having it and pro eating it. So which one is true? Uh, one? Well, it's fooled us again. <laughs> the second one is true. So, as you can see, ChatGPT is not just being good at Boris, it's actually good at fooling us. Uh, but it's not that great sometimes, because I asked it to write a joke. So I said, yo, give me a joke for Kubernetes, right? Because we talk about Kubernetes here. And it says, why did Kubernetes container start a work route, workout routine? Well, it wanted to sh uh, be in ship shape before it was deployed. You can imagine it's not really a great joke, right? Not a great joke. What do you think? Good, bad? Bad. Eh. Let's get, let's get one more. Let's see if we can do any better. Give me a joke for Kubernetes. Why did the, what did the engineer say when asked for reasons to use Kubernetes? Four or four not found. That's worse. Better? <laughs> better or worse? <laughs> better? Some people think better or worse? Slightly better. Slightly better. I wrote that joke. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to pretend that it was AI. But no, it's, that's, that's what this is. But here yeah. you go. let's introduce ourselves. Yeah, let's, let's quickly, like, okay, my name is Mauricio Salatino. I'm at Salavoy. I'm working for a company that's called Diagrid. We help people run uh, cloud native applications and scale them up. Uh, and the, the company is heavily invested on a project called Dapper. Uh, I'm writing a book titled Platform Engineer on Kubernetes. That's a QR code, and that's my age plus a discount code of 40%, which is really bad. But there you go. <laughs> I will share that later on on Twitter for sure. Excellent. You go. Uh, my name is Salman Iqbal. You can find me on Twitter at Salman Iqbal, only because I couldn't get Salman Iqbal on Twitter. I work as a consultant for Appia. It's a company for a cloud native, a cloud -native consult consultancy company, and we, we have a Kubernetes project product that makes it easier to use Kubernetes and cloud resources. We are going to be in, in the sponsor booth, so just you know, check us out in uh, Appia. And I also work as a trainer for Kubernetes. I mainly work on like MLOps stuff, so well, it's just basically DevOps for machine learning, uh, making sure that we can run machine learning workloads in, in more efficiently. I'm not writing any books, but uh, you know, that's, that's me. If you're wondering, Salaboy and Salman, yes, there's something in common, the first syllable. But yeah, that's, that's us both. That's so much let's get to the actual bit. We've all seen this. I don't need to explain. If you need to do anything cloud-native way, there's a bunch of tools that are available. As you can see, we've all seen this bit. What if you need to do machine learning stuff? 
what do you have to do? Of course, you can use some of these tools out there, but there is machine learning has its own landscape. Uh, this is done by a company called ML Reef 2021. Uh, so you can see it's a, bit, uh, a couple of years old. If you want to do anything like, uh, let's say, if you want to do CICD in machine learning, we can use some tools. There's some tools out there that also help with machine learning. If you need to do modeling, if you need to do training, there's a bunch of tools out there that we can utilize. The problem with this is if we ask, and people do, here do machine learning or data science, anybody does that? Just yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. You all use chat GPT, so yeah, we all do it, right? So, yeah. um, if we ask, so we work with data scientists or machine learning engineers, um, if we ask them to install these tools on any of the resources that they might have, cloud providers, clusters, or whatever it is, it is a big ask. You know, we keep talking about uh, as data scientists and machine learning engineers, learning all of this is quite a lot, lot to ask them. If you ask them to install it in a consistent way, uh, instead of getting, getting something like this, we might end up with something that's installed on the cluster or on the resources, but it's not as nice as we think it should be. It's not as maintainable. It's not as scalable, right? So this is, this is the situation that we can get in. So what, what, can, we, what can we do? Uh, I'm going to pick up on Elon Musk now. Have you seen this, uh, this podcast? <laughs> you seen this podcast? If you, if you scroll to like 44.25, and zoom in, the guy's smoking some platform engineering. <laughs> That's what we need, right? Yeah. So this is exactly what That's we need. That's the kind of thing that we, we need. need. We need some platform engineering. So now Salaboy is going to take over and talk about platform engineering. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's, that's pretty much what's going on, right? Like you have different kind of teams building different kind of platforms with different requirements, and you ended up with these situations with clusters filled up with stuff that nobody knows how to configure or how to get working together, right? And we created a project here, like in GitHub, like it's Rejects EU 2023, where we, what we are trying to achieve here is to create these different style of platforms with different examples, some for machine learning, some for more like developer-oriented stuff. And then we are starting to try to combine different tools together to accomplish different things. Uh, there is like a step-by-step -step tutorial in there. It's pretty long uh, and it's pretty complicated on purpose, just to show that this is complicated and not that easy to, to replicate. So the first thing and, and the first thing and the first challenge that you will face, if you are not very mature in your Kubernetes journey, you will need to uh, start learning on how to glue different projects together, and then you will get your hands really, really dirty. <laughs> right. uh, there is a white paper uh, on platforms that was published uh, very, very, uh, like, very, like a couple of weeks ago about like platform engineering and like different aspects of different platforms. This is not targeting only Kubernetes, but as you can see, most of the projects that are listed there are kind of like coming from the CNCF space. But in order to build these platforms, you actually, again, need to understand a little bit more about what tools you should be using to um, bring things together. And then how do you expose all these things that you're installing to your teams, depending what those teams are, right? Like if you have developers, you might give them some developer tools. If you have machine learning people, you probably need to make sure that they can use the tools that they already know how to use. And that includes Python, like a lot of Python. So in the repository that I was showing, um, we have kind of like a cluster set up with a bunch of tools. And again, because we try to um, install and, and, and configure all these things together, it gets kind of like quite complex. I've been working with Kubernetes for five years, and it took me quite a while just to get all this stuff in there. Like, it's not that hard, but at the end of the day, if you, want to, um, if you have multiple projects using the same frameworks, but in different versions, it becomes really, really complicated. And then setting up multiple clusters is not something that I would expect someone from, from ML to do, except like Salman, that he can create clusters. You can create clusters, right? Yeah, but uh, not some. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, that's true. <laughs> so um, some of the projects that we are using is like, I'm a very big fan of a project that's called Crossplane. How many people here know Crossplane? Have heard about it? Okay. All the room. Yeah, there you go. That's pretty popular. I don't need to explain that one. Big Cluster. How many people here know about Big Cluster? Okay, a couple. For the ones that doesn't know Big Cluster, basically what you can do is you can create clusters inside clusters, and that's usually very useful when you have multi-tenant like use cases and when you need more isolations than namespaces in a, in a cluster. So every time that you create a virtual cluster, you have like a new Kubernetes API server that is completely isolated for the for the main cluster, and and that allows you to give access to teams to these uh, new completely isolated API servers, which is pretty good. So we are using that. I'm using Knative. How many people here know Knative? Okay, that's 
a bunch of people. Like I would tend to focus on Knative serving here because I think that by installing Knative in, into a Kubernetes cluster, you give like development teams uh, the ability to experiment with their applications, and also you get like auto scaling as well, which includes um, scaling down to zero as well, which is pretty important. And Interestingly enough, Knative is something that it's been, been heavily used by a bunch of uh, machine learning projects just to serve models. When you need to expose you know, like your trained models for other teams to consume, there are tons of projects like Kubeflow and KServe that are using basically Knative to, to actually expose these things. And finally, Dapper, that's the project that I'm working on mostly nowadays, it, which is a distributed application runtime. Uh, and again, it gives a bunch of components to application developers to interact with infrastructure without adding dependencies to your applications, which actually it, it simplifies the development process quite a lot. The idea here is that uh, you can configure these components at the platform level, and then application, applications can use like local HTTP and gRPC calls to interact with this infrastructure without adding any drivers or libraries to connect to databases or message brokers or even kind of like use stuff like, like workflows. So let's do the first demo, which is a very like the weirdest demo that I've done uh, in, in, in some long time, which is showing this GitHub repository. And again, these glue things together section. Zoom is, in a, zoom in a bit yeah. More, All right. Yeah. I can zoom a bit. But the, the, the idea here is to show that, okay, you create clusters, you install cross-plane, you install a bunch of other things, you keep configuring things, you install Knative, you install a networking layer, you, install, uh, you configure some ingresses, then you install Dapper using Helm, and then you create namespaces, install Argo CD, do some port forwarding so I can access the stuff, get secrets, create namespaces, install Redis in a bunch of places, get passwords, configure Argo, install KubeRay and KubeServe just to get something up and running, right? At the end of the day, the only thing that I did is um, have my Argo CD installation point into a Git repository. This, I can also zoom this. It's pretty simple. But the only thing that this gives me is uh, a cluster with a bunch of namespaces there. Like if I do namespaces, because I like my terminals to be small, <laughs> but that doesn't fit. I have a bunch of namespaces now with a bunch of software installed. It, it is kind of working together, but still there are tons of things that we can do better. And if I do, for example, uh, I'm listing just here like the Knative services in production. I have an application that is actually downscaled to zero, so it might take a while to, to load like the first time just to bootstrap. But it's just a simple application that is running in my production namespace. right? And that takes us to the next point, right? I spend a bunch of time configuring all these so you can install all these tools in a single cluster. That cluster is usually kind of like a management cluster, right? Because you don't really want to run like Argo CD in the same cluster where you're running your like workloads, like your production go log. So this is like more like a management cluster that it's controlling different things and it's going to allow me to create uh, different environments. And that takes us to our second point, right? Yeah. Which so is, yeah. Based on what Mauricio has just talked about, so this is also based on some of the experience that we've had in building these platforms for some of the machine learning and data scientist teams. When we think about data science, we always think like, oh, we just need some training data, need some test data, let's just train a model and then evaluate and start serving. That's all we think. But I'm sure you've seen this image before, but the reality is much different because the actual machine learning part is usually okay. You can kind of manage it on you locally, but if you need to scale up, of course, there's, there's another story. There's a ton of other stuff that we now call platform engineering that everybody has to care about. Things like how do you manage your resources? How do you make sure you collect the right data? What's the serving infrastructure? If you serve a model, when you train a model and you serve it, as in people can infer, send requests to it, um, we need to understand if we can scale up and scale back down when the, when the, when the requirements, when there's a bunch of traffic on there. So all of this is quite a lot. And, a lot. and Eric was mentioning a few minutes ago, you know, we, developers don't know sometimes. We've had, it's happened in the past. Something is logging, and you got like a bill for 20K. How, what do we expect uh, machine learning and data scientists, engineers to know that? So basically, there's a bunch of requirements. And what, what they do is, if we think, if we break down like the machine learning stuff into supervised and unsupervised uh, a training. This is this is an example for a supervised training. Usually, you ETL so extract, transform, and load, load, get some data, and do some training, do your analysis, and do your predictions, and you keep going over the loop. So the requirement is that what they want to do. If we bring this image back up, 
data scientists and machine learning engineers, what they want to do is just use their frame, favorite frameworks and libraries, stuff like PyTorch, TensorFlow. That's what they want to use. And what they also want to use is just to deploy their model. Once they've trained it, they want to deploy it so people can start using it. Not just people, development teams as well. So this is something that Salabo is going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Within an organization, you've got data scientists and machine learning engineers that could be training a model, whatever it might be, like cat detection or some, a model that detects if uh, the text is generated by AI. That's uh, yes, something coming. <laughs> yeah. But, and then what you want to also do is serve the model. So these are some of the frameworks. How can we go ahead and make utilize, utilize these frameworks? Well, there's a few things we can do. If we are using Kubernetes itself, of course, you can always, because most of these are Python frameworks. So if you were doing training, you can build an image and you can do a normal deployment in Kubernetes and just run it how you will. But some of these frameworks, the one that uh, is in here, there's like MXNet and Ray, they usually do is they take the job and they split it and run it on a number of machines. And the way it works, I'm sure people use MXNet. If you haven't, it's like PyTorch, but for d deep learning. What you have is kind of like what we have with the Kubernetes architecture. Uh, a job can be split over into multiple nodes because something that could take a while takes a shorter amount of time. And what you have is a scheduler and a server and you have worker nodes. And all of these are actual machines. So virtual machines or physical machines. What we can do with these things is install on the cluster as controllers. If we install on the cluster as controllers, the controllers are already available. And this is what we are going to talk about. Just have a standardized way of installing these tools. Then all of these things become a pod in the cluster. And if, we, if all of these things run as a pod in the cluster, we can scale up, we can scale down, and that's great. And we have a standardized way of using it. Uh, so you can do MXNet, TensorFlow Jobs, you can do Ray, there's another thing that we're going to touch upon later on. We can do that in a standardized way. So in a platform way, we install it on the cluster, and then we can do that. What about when it comes for serving? I'm, that's the two things I'm going to focus on. So everybody will come to you, I've got a model that I trained with TensorFlow. I've got a model that I trained with PyTorch. And what you end up with when you have a train model is just like a, a file that you stick in a storage somewhere, and people can just send HTTP requests to it, send an image, get a reference back, inference back, and say, yeah, you, your image is a cat or not a cat. If we were to deploy it, you can put it in a storage container anywhere uh, in uh, an S3 bucket, and people can send requests. But the problem with that is sometimes uh, if there's a lot of, requests com lot of requests coming in, you can't handle it, so you have to scale up and scale down. And this is where this project called KServe, uh, part of Kubeflow, uh, with, with separate kind of, comes in quite handy. It says, we don't care what uh, uh, framework you use to train your model. As long as you have KServe, you use Knative underneath and a bunch of other things, Istio, Kubernetes, as you can see, we're building up. And then you can serve any model, doesn't matter what it is. So that's like a, what we found was a standardized way of adding your models in and people can use it. So that's from like machine learning point of view. So you can see, uh, if you want to do something, this is what we've used. So now Mauricio is going to talk yeah. about developers. So on, on the developer side, it really depends on your company and what your developers are doing, right? So it, it's all about like what tools do you need to have in your clusters that you are going to give to developers so they can just do the work that they need to do, right? You need to make sure that whatever you install there, make them more productive, right? So usually the, the demo that I have here is Knative Dapper. I'm going to add open feature at some point, but again, it's like what capabilities these environments, these Kubernetes clusters need to have for developers to do the stuff that they are doing. And I think that that's a pretty important thing, just giving Kubernetes clusters to developers will push developers to learn a bunch of stuff. And you can start simplifying that experience by saying, OK, you know, this, uh, this environment has auto-scaling on. It also has the possibility for you to do different release strategies. And it can also connect to all this available infrastructure that it's already for the application to use, like databases or, or message brokers or secret stores or whatever. So for this demo, uh, what I wanted to show, it's a little bit about what we did uh, here in the repository. Again, as I mentioned before, we are using uh, Crossplane. And I've created a bunch of cross-plane compositions to create different kind of environments. Let me zoom this up a little bit more. Uh, and what I have here is, for example, um, a resource that it's been, uh, be, it's been managed by, by, um, by cross-plane that allows me to create, in this case, development environments. So I have a very simple CRD here that it's kind of environment, and it has a bunch of parameters down the bottom, in this case, just a simple example. 
And I'm also using labels to define what kind of uh, environment do I want to create. So if a development team needs to request a new environment, the only thing that they need to do is they need to send this request to the platform, uh, uh, cluster in this case, the one that I'm connected with, and new environments will be provisioned for them with all the tools that they need inside that environment. Uh, for this demo, I'm using B cluster. So every time that I create a new environment, I'm creating a new virtual cluster inside my platform cluster. But doesn't nothing stop us to create new clusters using cross-playing in you know in a cloud provider and then installing all these tools. Uh, and I have the same thing for like ML, right? Like so, I have the same kind of like the same interface. Uh, it's nothing different. Just the, the label is different here. So I have a different type of, of um, environment there that it's called ML in the in the label. And that's going to basically get a different composition from Crossplane that it's combining different tools together uh, for, for that kind of environment. Because it's a Kubernetes resource, what I can do is I can do uh, QCTL get environments, and I will be able to have a list of all, my, all the available environments that I've created. And as I mentioned before, these environments are, uh, in this case, big clusters that are separate clusters that I can give access to my development teams to access and, and interact with. Uh, if I go back here, let me see. Yeah, so the application here, this is kind of like the thing that I have in, in my production environment. Hello, rejects. It's, it's really bad. Sorry for the UI. Um, I didn't have enough time to, but, you know, this should kind of work. Yeah, so basically it's just storing some strings using a database and dapper somewhere there. Uh, but when I created, like, this new uh, Team A development environment, as I mentioned before, I have now a new cluster that uh, it doesn't, that this is kind of like the interesting part, I would say, it's a new cluster that doesn't have neither Knative or Dapper installed in it. It's actually using some of the new features on the B cluster side to reuse all the tools that I have uh, installed in the, in, the, in the host cluster. So if I list my, in my, the namespaces here in my, in my host cluster, I will see that I have like Knative installed, I have Dapper installed as well, and I have Crossplane, right? But I don't want to use Crossplane from my, from my development environment, so I will give access only to you know, my Knative installation and also to my Dapper installation. So what I will go and do now is I will connect to this uh, new cluster that I've created, like the development team cluster. And I can do that by running this command here, which is bcluster connect to that cluster. That's called team A. So I'm connecting to that cluster now. Um, as soon as I'm connected to the new cluster, this is, again, a new API server. So I can get uh, the namespaces here, and there is nothing installed in that cluster, right? So it's a completely separate cluster. But if I list the CRDs, you can see that I have some Knative CRDs already configured and uh, the Dapper CRD for components. So I can actually interact with Dapper components from this cluster without having Dapper installed in this virtual cluster. Big cluster is syncing resources from this like, virtual cluster to the host cluster that has these controllers running, so I can reuse the same installation uh, from that cluster. If I don't do this, uh, what I will need to do is I will need to create big clusters and then install all these frameworks and all these tools in every you know, cluster that I create, and that's basically replicating all the control planes for all the tools multiple times, that's definitely not cost effective. Uh, and basically what I can do here uh, is I can list my Knative services again. So I have my application deployed automatically when I created the composition, that's part of the composition. And uh, this basically gives me access to a different uh, instance of the application that now it's running inside the big cluster. And bcluster is, is handling all the routing, all the traffic to, to this new instance. And I can say, hello, regex from me, here, from dev. Right. So this is a different cluster using a different uh, database instance as well uh, than the one that I have in production. So that's why you need to install like, a bunch of databases in different places. But this is showing basically that you can create like these lightweight development environments that are reusing a bunch of controllers that are installed in a different place. And you can create as many of these as you need for, for your development teams. You will need, of course, like a, a large like host cluster, but that's, that's a different thing. And that takes me to the next point, I think. Yep. Yeah, so, so Mauricio showed you the, thank you. Uh, Mauricio showed you the developer experience of how creating the environment. What well, also there is when you, when you check out the, uh, the demo itself, uh, because we don't have time here, check out the repository that Mauricio is sharing. When we create the ML environment, that installs all the CRDs and all the controllers yep. that we need for machine learning. So there is an example in there for one of the frameworks that we picked because that was used, Ray framework, and that also does similar to what MXNet does. 
you submit a job and in terms of parallelization, it will take your job and submit it onto the cluster itself and split it out and all those pods will become worker nodes and it will run it. The point here is that what we found is data scientists and machine learning engineers do not like YAML files. People like YAML files here? <laughs> Everyone's laughing. Do not like YAML files, right? of course, because they're used to writing Python. That's what they're used to writing. They, they want to write Python. So you can check this out. I don't think we have time to no, do no, this demo. No, no, let's, this let's demo. Do yeah. So what they want to do is they want to just basically submit their requests like they're doing. Just run their Python scripts. So this is what you can see in the, uh, in the, the demo itself when you do this. Everything is running in the cluster. We've got this. Uh, you can train your scripts. Uh, you can train your models by running. They have a CLI called Ray Job, Ray CLI. You can submit your job like you normally would. Or you can run the Python script by using python script.py. Uh, if we were to use the approach that we're talking about here, is data scientists and machine learning engineers keep doing what they're doing already. Just write as if they're running stuff locally. So they don't have to like write YAML files, submit the requests to the cluster. This is connected. This, uh, this Ray CLI is actually connected to the cluster that's running elsewhere. But for them, it's all good because they're just submitting a job. Granted, you still have to understand if things break, you have to go and look at the pod, uh, pod log and all of this stuff. But here, the developer experience, the machine learning and engineers that are using it is much more akin to what they're used to rather than, hey, now you've got to understand Dapper, now you've got to understand this, you've now got to understand that. It's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So the final thoughts with all of this is there's a few things that we just want to bring to your attention. Of course, what you saw here, Mauricio, showed you all these projects. And the reason why we have to do them, the reason why we had, to, we had to use them, is because they're all serving a purpose. And I'm sure we all agree, in order to do something quite simple like, OK, maybe not that simple, training a model and serving a model at scale and consistently across teams, across organizations, there's a lot of things we have to install on the cluster. And that's maybe fine. But also, all these projects have different release cycles, different versions, compatibility issues. You need to be experts at being able to like, build platforms at this level. So it's quite hard. A small organization with a few people might not be able to handle this. You can install, you can get up and running, but we're not at that maturity level that when things break, you actually need to be an expert. Like we were figuring out some Istio issues the other day because it wasn't working. So it's quite hard. Sometimes you might just get away with using cloud services, right? So maybe ML, code, ML Lab or anything like that. So it's quite a lot. Uh, and we're a bit, still a bit far away from what we, we want to get to. So I will leave you with this final thought before I share it. I'm, I'm sure you all remember a time when DevOps was big, right? All of this stuff was hard to do in DevOps, correct? Do we all agree? It's kind of hard to do in DevOps. It will hit you in the face. But now we have platform engineering. The outcome is the same. <laughs> But at least for the next year, it might look cool while you're doing it, right? <laughs> that's what we're going to say. So um, that's what we wanted to talk yeah. to you about today. Uh, here are some of the links. Uh, we, we can share yeah. the slides later on. Yeah, I will be sharing this, these links uh, in Twitter. I have some stickers as well. These are a bunch of blog posts uh, showing different collaborations with different projects that basically are we showing here, kind of like in the demo, and how we install everything together. There is a lot about like developer experience in that, and also a bunch of other stuff about like platform building. So if you want to check it out, I will be sharing there in Twitter. Uh, this is just a photo I've put up here. Uh, at we are at, uh, at a booth in, in KubeCon. We've got some cool socks. I'm, I'm sure you agree there's pretty cool beavers mm, there. Um, yeah, just you know, drop by, say hi. Um, That's it. Mauricio's book, yeah. buy it. But thank you all thank for Thank you listening. very much. Do you have time Good. for it? So we might have time. We have a 20-minute break, but we might have time for like one question. Otherwise, you can chase them in the hallways. Let's do one question. OK, we've got, question. we've got one question there. Oh, Jensi. Great. It's just a quick question, but um, ideally, you know, what should the developer have to know? I mean, besides doing his or her uh, Python application, I, mean, I saw that you know, two-line thing, but that just seems to be too good to be true. So you know, how does it usually work? Very, <clears throat> very good question. I, I know generally, though. No, this is very like good three question. or four people, and they're doing everything. But yep. you know, if they were, if, but but in an ideal world, should yeah yeah. So the question, if I if I may repeat it, just to make sure I got it right, is what do the data scientists and machine learning engineers need to know apart from you know, let's say, 
to submit a job in Python. That's all done because of the projects we've picked. So in some cases, we might get lucky and say, we have to do just write this. If you're submitting a job and using Ray, you're good to go. All you need to do is, I removed a flag which says where the cluster is, where, where, the, where the Ray cluster is running. Uh, that's all they need to know. But you don't always get lucky like that. If you need to use KServe to serve the models, you still have to write YAML files. Also, if things go wrong, where do you go and look for it? Luckily in Ray, there's a dashboard that tells you your jobs that are failing. So they can access the dashboard. So in that instance, they might need to not, they don't need to know too much more than where it's running. All if for they look at it and go, oh, this is fine. Everything is, everything is as it is. But if you pick other projects, not so lucky. That's why I wanted to show this example. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time it stays the same, but in some cases not so lucky. Okay. Thank you all for listening. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Thank you.